looking to improve your life, brush up on your personal growth techniques, you are in the right place. Welcome to Life's Little Lessons with your host, author of Designing Your Own Destiny, Kevin A. Dunlap. Hello, this is Kevin Dunlap with Life's Little Lessons, and welcome back to our show. I'm so glad that you're with us here today. And today we have our second person all coming in all the way from Canada. This time she's coming from Montreal, Quebec which is on the east coast of Canada. And today, our special guest is a lady by the name of Sabrina Prioletta. This is a lady I met a little more than three years ago at a class that actually was life transforming for me. And I'm so glad I met her at that class and we're actually having her on my show. And she has a company that she is the founder of called Siva Marketing. Now, she is a branding identity director of this company. And she's going to be sharing with us today all different kinds of ideas about branding, stuff that you may not even have ever thought of before. So today, I want to welcome Sabrina Prioletta. Thank you for joining us today. And thanks for having me, Kevin. It's so great to connect with you again. It seems like just yesterday that we spoke, and it's, uh, it's really fun to you know, sometimes in life, you, you meet people along the way, and you never know how things connect mm -hmm. until they, they actually come together. And then they do, like you mentioned, three years into it. And yeah, like, here we are having a podcast together. So it's really great to be here again. And just so I can inform the listeners here and also the viewers for those that are actually watching the video, Sabrina and I, we met in, I think, October 2014, I think is when it was. Yeah. And we may have talked twice since then before today's actual recording. So yeah. I'm so glad that we are reconnected. You made an influence on me way back then when you, you, you mentioned some things I had never heard about before. And then when we actually talked maybe about what, four, three, four weeks ago, when I was asking you to see if you might want to be part of the show. And again, we talked about what I believe you call the archetypes of branding. Yes. Could you tell us why it is that you do what you do? You picked branding, which is, as I thought was very similar to marketing, but you came to me and corrected me and say, no, branding is completely different, a different animal than marketing. It's like comparing it to, to a car and the gas that you put into the car. So the car is the vehicle that gets your message uh, sort of propelled and, and shared with the public at large. That, that's very important. So the type of car you choose, uh, you know, the type of wheels you put, like we've got really bad winters in Canada, so we want to be really careful about uh, winter tires and stuff like that. So all of the branding is really the fuel. Like what are you feeding your car with? And ultimately, it gives not only power, but it gives direction, almost like a GPS. So think GPS and fuel is the branding, and the vehicle that gets your message across is, is the car. Okay. And depending on the kind of branding you're using, you could be using low grade uh, with 87% to high grade, high octane. I mean, it's all, so the branding, the fuel itself is also very important as well as even, as you just said, the GPS system you're using. It's very important. And as you know, with some luxury cars, you need to put a certain type of fuel. You know, you can't just go with unleaded and just like switch it up. You need to be very consistent about the type of fuel you use in order to get maximum sort of effectiveness or have your car running well for many years. And in that way, when we speak about ourselves or about our companies, most of us tend to, we switch it up. So we say, well, let me try this way today and let me try this way tomorrow and whatever sticks will stick versus having a very clear direction and clear value system. And that's really what keeps the car going forward and on track, basically. So it's really about who are you in order to get to where you want to go. That's okay. the first step. Yeah. And, and tell me a little bit about Siva Publishing, uh, or excuse me, Siva Marketing. And I see, for those of you that are watching the video, she's got a banner in the background with uh, with our logo th there. Uh, could you tell me a little bit about Siva? Where, where did that name come from? What does that mean to you? Actually, in Hinduism, Siva is a deity. And it's, uh, it's actually known as the deity, uh, the famous god of, of yoga oftentimes. Siva, also pronounced as Shiva, is the transformer or the destroyer. So it's, it's, to, it's the god that actually is able to release any of the old in order to create new. So there's always a really important balance. When, when you're about to create something new, you need to make space. You need to let go of things that are not serving you or not propelling you forward. And a lot of us in life, whether it's for our businesses or our personal lives, we want to hold on to everything. I'm a, I'm a hoarder. I'm actually, I'm doing a huge purge back at home right now because I like to keep stuff, right? And a lot of us do. 
because they're memories and because they represent milestones in life. But the important thing is, is that especially when you're marketing or branding yourself is ultimately who am I and where am I going? And if I hang on to all this baggage that represented me five or 10 or 20 years ago, am I really presenting myself in the truest light? And the answer is no. SIBA was an inspiration for me because it was exactly where I was at that moment in my life. Okay. I was at crossroads and I knew I had to let go of my corporate side because I worked for 15 years or so for large companies before launching my own company. So I had to let go of my past as well. Okay. And how long have you been doing this for uh, on your own? About five years now. Five years? Okay. Yeah. And do you, do you have any employees? Is it all you or do you have like a network of people? Yeah. So I've got a small team and it's interesting. So that as well, I mean, that keeps changing. So it's, it's gotten bigger. It's gotten smaller. Flexibility is the one word I want any entrepreneur to take away. Anyone who's listening, anyone who's thinking of launching their own business, if there's one thing that I can tell you, whatever you had on your business plan <laughs> will change a thousand and one times. That includes staff, that includes associates or just different partnerships you may form over time. It's just keeping in mind that nothing is constant and uh, just being as flexible as possible. So right now, I've got a small team, but really solid and uh, the people that not only I can trust, but people that reflect our own brand image. So I often hire, by the way, and this is a great way to hire people. And I've actually started talking to different HR departments about including it in their uh, hiring process. So understanding your company brand image or positioning is really important because you can reach out and when you get 30 different applicants and everyone, you know, maybe there's five top ones that seem really strong. You want to get to know what their brand identity is as individuals okay. and marry that up with your company. Okay. So you try to find somebody that fits within kind of like your own corporate culture in a way. Sure. Sure. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. It and uh, so you've been doing this for five years, been on your own for five years. Were you doing the same similar thing with corporate America beforehand, you know, working in yeah. branding? And yeah, so I was, uh, I managed uh, different brands. So I went from world of tobacco back in the world when, uh, when it was cool. And it was, it was, so I started off in tobacco. I went off into cosmetics, um, worked on different fragrance brands, personal care brands. I was on Adidas for about three years. That was an incredible experience because Adidas is, is global, but it was very, very strange in terms of what we can and can't do for North America, right? So everything had to be approved by many different levels. And I thought that was a huge learning experience. And I understood for the first time the importance of remaining consistent with your brand message, with your brand positioning. And Adidas was a beautiful example for that. And then from there, I moved on and I worked uh, for a Canadian a beer company called Molson, did archetype branding and branding with them as well. And then I went on to uh, print publishing. So I was the director of marketing for one of our newspapers here. And that world changed as well because their business model is no longer what it used to be. We don't have the subscribers that we used to, right? Who, who orders a newspaper anymore? So everything's online. So that entire business model had to change. And they also needed to identify what their brand voice was to bring it out on the digital world. And that's what I, I did for them. So great experiences that were all transferable and who really that have assisted in building this brand today. I guess my question to you is because a lot of entrepreneurs are just getting started with their businesses. What are some of the probably the most important things they need to know about branding in, in, if they're doing it on their own or if they're going to be looking for a company that does the branding for them? What, what are they looking for? And I'm assuming this is more than just a slogan or their colors or anything like that. What specifically, uh, could, could you give us an example of some brandings? Yes. Yeah, so I, I'd say like, and I'll give you a couple of, of brands that are really well known that we can all pretty much resonate with. But I think one of the most important things is to understand why you're doing what you're doing. You why? know, the, the big, the big why I just had a, an hour and a half conversation with a client today about why. And I've been working with them for a while now and we're still, you can spend a lot of time really distilling your true motivation for being in business, your true motivation for, for speaking, for, for sharing a message. 
ultimately, what is it that you're out there to serve or to do as a company? And so this comes up in terms of traits and behaviors and value systems. And these are all different processes and things that you want to keep in mind. And the examples that I'll, I'll bring you, just so, so it becomes a little bit more clear, think of Nike. And so everyone knows Nike, right? The, mm -hmm. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. So Nike, just do it. The entire brand positioning is based on a very, very simple concept. And that simple concept is mastery. So everything that Nike does, and I'd love to show you some, some visual examples now if I could, but really every visual representation, every time Nike has created a hashtag, a campaign, anything, it's been about mastery. It's been, been about exceeding your own limits and being so competitive that you're not getting to the finish line, you're getting through the finish line. And until you get through that finish line, I heard that one day, I was like, that's a brilliant expression, right? Through the finish line. And how many of us stop right before we're about to get to the finish line and we tend to slow down or we tend to not give it that 150%. Well, anyone who really truly believes in the Nike archetype, which is the hero, believes that they will do anything it takes to get to the top, to be the best, and to their own demise sometimes. You know the people that are never happy with the results and they're like, oh yeah, that was nothing. Yeah, that was first place, but that was easy and they dismiss it. Well, that, you know, maybe your archetype or one of your archetypes may be the hero. And we could compare that to, I don't know, to, for example, uh, a Coca-Cola, and Coca-Cola is very much a brand that's about uh, belongingness, that's about creating connection, but you'll never see someone drink a Coca-Cola alone or drink a Coca-Cola while they're competing to get somewhere on time or to, no, Coca-Cola is really about enjoying the experience with the people around you, creating connections and creating just memories in the moment. So it's very much an every person brand. So Coca-Cola is really about just loving everyone, making sure no one feels excluded and enjoying that moment. So those are two different examples. So it's like, and, and there are actually several different archetypes that you can fall under, but every one of us has one dominant archetype okay. at any point in our lives. And how many archetypes are there? So there's the Carol Pearson model, which is one that I use a lot because I think it's, it's really the most effective. There are 12 dominant ones. And within that, there are four to five different sub archetypes that are okay. a crossover of one another. But there are 12 dominant ones that go from hero to caregiver to, you know, to the wizard to, you know, there, there's so much fun. So I can do this for hours. And once people realize who they are and who their company is, well, then it becomes a lot easier to market yourself. So it's not really about what do people want to hear? It's what message do I want to share? What is it that really gets me going? What is it that I'm so passionate about that I need to express it to the world? And once people know that, once companies know that, well, they've got, they've got that direction. They've got the fuel in their car. They've got the GPS. They know where they're headed. And then anything that comes along the way is not a distraction or not as much of a distraction. Okay. Entrepreneurs tend to, and tell me if I'm going off on a, on, on no, a you're, tent, right? You're good. <laughs> you're, you're good. So what they tend to do is they, you know, they compare and they say, well, what's my competitor doing? And maybe I should sound a little bit like them and position myself like this or like that. Well, it's not about them. It's about truly finding uniquely what distinguishes you and, and what you're most, you should be most proud of. And even those things that are like the quirks, the things that you're embarrassed about, those are the things that people love about you. And those are pe things that people love about your brand. And so it's really about becoming aware and conscious about what those things are I like to say that we're the catalyst in that. We will bridge you. Once, once we got that going, once we've got that awakened within you, we will bridge you with your proper message or your marketing strategy, whatever the case is. But we get to know you. We get you to transform. And then we get you to share that message out in a very authentic and powerful way. And with somebody, let's say not a solopreneur, a, a, a one-person entrepreneur, is starting to think about starting a business, 
would you suggest that their business archetype be similar to their own personality style or does it really matter that much? It does. And that's a great question. So a lot of us want to be another personality. And I just had this really great workshop the other day. And I remember as I was talking about the personalities, there was one person in the room who said, well, I think my archetype is caregiver, but that's not really cool. Like no one really connects with an archetype that's a caregiver. So maybe for my business, should I become this other one, which was like the opposite of a caregiver? And I said, well, that just wouldn't align with who you are as a human. So if you are the face of your brand specifically if you are and or if you've got a smaller medium-sized business it becomes that much more important that the the brand archetype that you are uh, aligning with is one that matches your own personality because people will see what right through you so it's really important to be tight with that message and why not pick something that represents you it's it's easier on a day-to-day -day. it okay. really is because otherwise you're kind of being an imposter in a way because you're, you're not being authentic when you're That's working outside of your own archetype, out of your own personality, or at least a small group together's personality. Exactly, because you can call yourself, you know, another archetype, but just based on the way you, you talk to people on the phone or based on the way you script an email, like you will always give out another message or the true, the true essence. I People know me by the way I script my emails and it's been like that since I've been young. Like I write the same way. And so it's very distinguished. So I can pretend to be someone I'm not, but that's not doing anyone justice, including not myself as a, as a business owner. So it's really about just becoming aware of who you are and accepting yourself for who you are. And most of us don't. And we, we hope to be someone else or aspire to be sometimes someone else or something else. But it's not about that. It's really about just getting in touch with your own core. Okay. Now, yeah. there, there's a, a book I wanted to uh, share with people. And I don't know if you've read the book. Or not, this is not something we've actually conversed about before. It's been on, on one of my earlier podcasts, though. It's a book called The E-Myth Revisited by Michael mm -hmm. Gerber. Have you read that book? I haven't read the book yet, but I've heard a lot about it. Okay. In the book, it talks basically, because you're kind of like the person that's the, the opposite of what the book talks about. And that's kind of why I'm bringing this up. In the book, it talks about this fictitious lady that she was a baker at a large company, and therefore now she wanted to become run her own bakery. And the book breaks people down to three different types of people. There's the entrepreneur, there's the manager, and then there's the technician. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, what the book talks about, to be honest with you, when I first read this book, this was about three, four years ago. When I first read the book, after reading the first two or three chapters, I was angry. I just wanted to throw a book across the room. It, was, it really pissed me off in, in that way. Did, and it's, did you see yourself in one of the personalities? Well, it said, and this is contradictory to what most people think. Then it says, if you're the expert, you know, you're working for a company and you're the expert, the chances of you succeeding is far less than if you were not the expert. Mm -hmm. It's just basically saying, okay, I'm, I'm really good baker. I'm a really good baker. I'm going to open up my own bakery because I'm a good baker. And the book says, you, you're most likely going to fail. Now, go over to, you have a better chance of running a hotel or a car dealership than you are at running a bakery. Yeah. And that may seem counter, uh, counterintuitive. However, what the book essentially talks about is if you're working as a technician where you're the expert, you're doing, uh, you're, you're the great technician and you go start up your own business, you have no idea how to manage and you have no idea how to be an entrepreneur. Because you're going to get stuck in the technician roles. You're going to get in those tasky roles. But you're kind of the opposite of that. You see, you were already doing branding for another company. And then you started out on your own. And, you, and, you, and now you've got multiple people working for you. So assuming you're the type of person that learn, hey, I have to be a manager. I can't do all of this myself. And you subcontract or hire employees that take over that for you. Yeah, and I, I agree, and that's a, that's a great uh, that's a great segue, and it's a great point that you're making because I did have the expertise, mm -hmm. I did manage because I had teams below me before. Okay. However, what was missing was the entrepreneurial hat yes. that I thought I thought like I've done this, I've done this for <laughs> multinationals, I can do it for like my, myself. And that was my biggest surprise. So you're, you're absolutely right where I wasn't able initially to take this off the ground. And I, I was so frustrated because I had the structure and I had all the insights. And yet it was, it was hard. 
and I kept falling and I kept thinking like, you're a terrible entrepreneur. Like, you know, <laughs> like this is just not working. Go back and get yourself a day job again. Like go back and do what you were doing. Two things happened. The first thing is I, I learned a lot about humility. I learned a lot about, well, you thought you knew all of this. You need to relearn different things. And the second thing is, which made me think while you were speaking about the importance of surrounding yourself with other people who are experts in areas that you are not. Mm -hmm. So I surrounded myself with a team of people, whether they're working for me or I, I hire them as third party, but people who have helped me build my business, who have the entrepreneurial mindset that I did not have. I went to networking events and I met other entrepreneurs and I learned from them. I hired the accountant. I hired the lawyer. I hired the people that I needed to, to make my business grow because I was not able to do it on my own. I was burning myself out. The first two years were very difficult because I did it all. <laughs> and and that, I'm glad you're saying that because a lot of people out here that are listening or watching are going to be saying, okay, I want to, do, I want to get my own business. And you did go through the struggles. So tell me about your, uh, yourself, some, some of your early successes. You know, when, when you're just starting out, what were some of those, er, those early successes? And then we'll segue into some of your early challenges as well. So what okay. were some of those er, uh, early successes that you had when you were first starting out? Well, I, I'd say that one of my first successes is really my first client. And it happened quite <laughs> naturally and organically. And I wasn't expecting it. I was actually doing this personal development course and I was learning how to connect with people. And that was one of the exercises is, you know, learn how to connect and be more interested in people. And, and that was, and so I was, I was doing all of that with this person who was a business owner, entrepreneur. He had an ice cream shop. My initial intention was to open up an ice cream shop. It was a completely different idea. I knew nothing about the food industry in terms of running my own you know, business in the food industry. And, and so, but I, I had taken off with this idea and thought, you know what, I need to create this business. It's seasonal. I can give back. And then the rest of the year, I'll be doing a whole bunch of other stuff. And for me, it was, it was a great sort of concept. And as I was sitting with this business owner and we were talking and connecting at one point, he looked at me and he said, Sabrina, why would you ever want to launch an ice cream business? You seem to know a lot about marketing. And I said to him, well, Casa, that's all I know. All I know is really marketing. That's what I've done all my life. And so he says, well, why on earth would you get into a nice cream business for? You know nothing about it. I can tell, you know, by the questions you're asking. And he says, you know what? I need help. He says, I'll hire you as my very first. Uh, he says, I'll hire you as my consultant. And he says, I've never hired marketing help before, but I really... I really feel comfortable with you. And he became my first client and referred other business my way afterwards. And so I got my, he was a small client, but then I, I had actually one of my biggest clients that came within months after that. And I went into it thinking this wasn't the plan. It was supposed to be the ice cream lunch. I was thinking about like strawberry and vanilla and here I am talking about marketing, right? And it's like, how did this happen? And so it just happened by chance really. And I thought that was a huge success because I didn't overthink it. I just went with the flow. And to me, that's a success. And then let me ask you this, because you said that first client came to you kind of uh, organically. Um, were you even thinking I'm taking him on as a client uh, before that? Or was it just an opportunity that came available? It's like, hey, let me seize this, seize this opportunity. Yeah, I, I seized the opportunity. I thought, okay, this, it could be great to earn some revenue, uh, you know, on the side while I'm starting up my business. But my intention was very clear. When I sat with him, I said, listen, I don't want to ever compete with you, but you've got a very well-established ice cream brand. And this is my intention. I want to launch something and I'd love for you to mentor me because I think that you've got a, lo a lot of expertise. And so he took the time. And so my intention was really to open up an ice cream business and so that kind of melted away if you will with time <laughs> which is i'm assuming you're very grateful for that you're actually doing something that you're more passionate about yes. and you love yes oh yeah. fantastic and then what were some of those early challenges i mean after getting the first client and then getting the second what were some of those early challenges that you had in getting started because what it sounds like to me was you had already quit your day job your regular job and you were Yep. starting to do this all on your own with basically no other income coming in at that time. 
That's right. And to that point, that created stress. And that's always what creates stress. So it's like, oh, where's the money going to come from? Let me (laughs) hurry, hurry. You got to like work harder and faster. And so though there was business that came sort of naturally at the beginning, then there was sort of like a stagnation period. The first couple of years became difficult. And so some of my challenges were uh, just the business development. And when I would be sitting with prospects, and this is like one of my messages that I would really want to share with all of you is like, when you're sitting with someone and you've got value to share and you've got knowledge and you, you know, you know that people are, are willing to listen, be cognizant and don't give it all away. Don't give it all away for free. So I used to sit with people who had not yet signed a contract with me. They were prospects. They were not clients yet. And I used to do this, like create this like two, three hour presentation and give them the strategy and give them all the answers. And then they would like take it and say, great, Sabrina, that was really, that was really insightful. We'll call you. Don't call us. And I thought, well, I, I put so much work into this. How? And I see you're trying to give, you're attempting to give as much value as you could, but you were giving away the, not only the milk, but you're giving away the cow as well. So therefore it's like, why do we even need her anymore? Exactly. So that was a challenge. And it was only a challenge once or twice because I didn't learn very quickly. <laughs> Some of us take a bit longer to learn than others. So it took me a few, a few times. And what I became uh, just very aware of over time is the value, like the, the just the, the quality rather of the clients that I will choose to work with or not. So if someone is not at a certain level, I, you know, or if they don't see the value in what we're about to do, and if they're going into it knee jerking or questioning, I probably will not be working with them. They're probably not a fit. Uh, So it's really not about forcing anyone. It's about just being yourself and attracting the type of people who resonate with that and it, it just goes back to being honest just really honest and, and i'm glad that you said that because a lot of people when they're first getting started they'll would, they would try to take on any client that they can regardless if it's actually a fit or not and then you'll find out i'm sure you have through hard knocks and i know i have with, with the different businesses that i have that sometimes not taking a client that wants to hire you is your best choice yes would you agree yeah, yeah indeed indeed it is because that allows for space. And so um, it, when you think about alchemy, which is uh, getting into like the, the wizard archetype now, but when you're thinking about al- alchemy and the process of creating something out of nothing, you must create a void. You must create space. Everything happens in the void. So if, there, if your life is cluttered, if your agenda is already filled with clients that are not maybe bringing the best profit margins. Well, guess what? You're not going to have time to meet with the new people or to, uh, or to attract those new people because you will be so busy just doing the same old, same old. And so everything happens within the void. And that's what is so important to do is to learn to say no, learn to have two hours free in a day, that's okay. That's when you can create. That's when you can pick up the phone and connect with people. That's where business comes from. Okay, uh, and I actually I do fully agree with you with that as well. And, and it's, I'm so glad that you're, you're sharing that with the, with the audience here. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Mm-hmm. And I guess let me ask you this then, because I've seen at least one of your employees just right before the call. We, you know, she was in the background. So tell, me, tell me about some of your, I guess, your recent successes. I mean, you've been in business five years. You said you were struggling the first couple of years, and now you've added people to, uh, to your team. You've let people go, obviously, because maybe it wasn't a fit or finance, yep. you know, whatever it is. Tell me, however, now that you've been in business for five years, could you tell me about some of your recent successes? Yeah. So I'd say that uh, there's, there's multiple ones. I, I don't want to get into uh, a lot of them really specifically, but I've worked. My, my goal, Kevin, was to never, ever become 
the specialist in one thing alone. I always believed in the importance of transferring knowledge. So when I was in the cosmetics business, I said, well, I want to change now and do something else. And I went into beer and then I went into, uh, you know, publishing and I went and I remember recruiters saying to me, well, no, you've been doing cosmetics for seven years. Go get a job in cosmetics. You'll become the best at it. And I said, I don't want to become the best. I want to continue to create. I want to continue to be the best at branding whoever. And that's when you become an expert is when you're able to, to get into a new situation and get those ideas and get that inspiration. So I never wanted to be at a point in my life where I had felt like I stagnated. So when you ask about successes and recent ones, I would say that I'm attracting so many different diverse clients. I mean, I've got, um, I've got companies that are in the cosmetics business. I've got clients that are coaches. I've got clients that are in real estate. I've got a, a law firm just recently uh, from Turkey who contacted me, word of mouth, I mean, from Turkey. I, I don't know. Like, this is, this is beautiful. So this, to me, is success, is when you're attracting such diverse personalities or diverse businesses, and they see and feel that you are, you're really understand their world, this, to me, is is something that I can say I'm proud about. And, and I, I will take the time to understand everyone individually. I'm always starting at zero. This is not a cookie cutter. This will never be a cookie cutter business. This is about taking the time with every single person individually and understanding what it is that they need for their companies, their organizations, and working with them so that they can build something to their image. To me, success is variety. And would you say all of that? Because this is absolutely amazing. You've got people in Turkey. You've got people, I'm sure, in the U.S. You've got people all throughout Canada and possibly other parts of the world. And for those of you that are starting your own businesses, especially the businesses kind of like Sabrina's, is that it's online. The world is your oyster. I mean, you, you can't take on people from all over the place. Time zones don't matter. I mean, with the Internet the way it is right now, you and I are right now on a Zoom call. There's also an audio recording, which will be part of the podcast. And we're doing this for three different time zones right now. You are in the Eastern time zone in Montreal, Quebec. I'm in actually Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm in the Pacific time zone. Yeah. So this is, this is phenomenal. It, it doesn't matter where you are. So this, world this is, of no boundaries. <laughs> the world of no boundaries. Yeah. I guess one of the other things is, because you definitely told us about some of your setbacks and stuff and challenges at the very beginning. As we are coming kind of cl- getting a little bit closer to the end, what are some of the lessons or upbeat moments that you would tell a, a, a starting entrepreneur that's just starting out or somebody that maybe wants to scale their business to the next level? Mm. I would say the biggest thing is trust your instinct. Okay. Trust your gut. I oftentimes, every time I got burnt in business, it's when I went against what I really felt was, uh, was truth whether it was getting into partnership with, with someone who just didn't share my business ethics. I okay. did that at the early stages, you know, started, um, you know, uh, sharing office space with someone and just didn't work. I never really felt it, but went forward because it made sense on paper. It just made, it was strategic, had to do it. It didn't work. So waste of time, waste of money, start again. Okay. When it comes to hiring people, you know, really connect with that individual. Make sure you're being true about where you are and why you're bringing people into your business. So I would say trust your your gut is a huge one. It will never misguide you. I would say that another big one for me um, is uh, set your limits. Setting limits is is really important in business, first of all, because you are wearing so many different hats and you're busy as an entrepreneur, so you need to have time to do all of this. But also, if you don't set your limits, people don't respect you as much. They don't see the value. They will not pay you because they know that when you say that you've got an hour, but you stay three hours for the meeting, they know that they shouldn't take you seriously. And you know what? They shouldn't. Because that clearly means you're not as busy as you say you are. They don't know that you're up till two in the morning working, catching up, but that, you know, it's all about perception. So setting limits is another big one. And I fully agree with you. The first thing that you talked about, I'll dovetail back into that one. However, if you don't have those limits, you're absolutely right. People are going to, number one, start taking advantage of you if they're actually doing business with you. 
that as an example, I've also been a realtor in the past. And if I answer that phone call at eight o'clock uh, at night on a Friday night, cause I want to be available for my client. No, heck no. Cause that means tomorrow night they could call me at nine o'clock. So yep. no, like, you know, set the limits. My office hours from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Anytime yep. after that, uh, in case of emergencies, yes. Other than that, no, you have to set those limits. And like you're saying, as well as say, hey, I, I'm going to come into your office and you say, I can only give you 20 minutes. You, you put a timer on at the 19 sure. minute mark. You got your one minute reminder. Like, hey, we got to wrap this thing up. Sure. So I'm glad you said that. Yeah. And it's about respecting the other person's time as well. And, and you know, scarcity, it's not for nothing that there, there's scarcity in most of the marketing messages that we hear. You know, limited time offer. Act quick. Act now. There's only 10 left. Oh my gosh, I need to have one. Well, you know what? Scarcity. Scarcity is important. So why not make ourselves a little bit more scarce and be really specific about how much time we give to people, we give to organizations. I mean, and that's good that you're saying that because a lot of people will bend over backwards for their clients. However, that is how sales, sales 101 is called a limiter. You either put a time limit on it, you put a quantity limit on it, or if possible, do both. You know, for the sense, we, we only going to be selling this for the next 15 minutes and, and we only have 12 available. Just like if you're saying, hey, I'm going to come by to your office at 1 o'clock and I have to leave by 2 o'clock because so I have a 2.30 appointment. You, you definitely have to have that in there. Even if that 2.30 appointment is to go to a yoga class or go catch a movie, you still have to put those limits on there. And yep. going b back to what you initially said about going with your gut. Now, I don't know if you've heard of this before or not. I know I've talked about this a couple of times before, and I was told this, and I actually fully believe it, is that we actually have three brains. Have you, have you heard of this before, uh, Sabrina? Tell me about it. Tell me about it. Which we, we have three brains. We have our head brain, our mental brain. Mm -hmm. We have our heart brain, and then we have our mm -hmm. gut brain. Mm -hmm. So you were saying, hey, I was going, I'm going to sign this contract, but it looks good on paper. That's going with your logical brain, head brain, but you're not going with your true self, your gut brain. Your heart brain is where the feelings are getting involved. They're like, hey, I want to give back. I want to get, okay, they want to take an extra hour. And your heart brain says, yes, that's okay. Well, your gut is like, no, it's not okay. <laughs> you may want to do that, but you know, you're coming from the heart, but you're not coming from your true self, which is your gut. So when you are looking at doing something new, like you were saying, doing the cosmetics or whatever, in your brain, your head brain, you're probably saying, this is something I like, this is whatever, but your gut was saying, no, this is not right. You're, you're, you're not in alignment there. No, nope, exactly. And, and you know what you're mentioning makes me think a lot is, is part of actually what we do. Um, have you heard of uh, Simon Sinek? Yes. Yeah, so he's, he's brilliant, right? He was a marketer and now he's, he's really a thought leader on leadership, on the importance of uh, sharing a, a message in a specific type of way. And he speaks uh, a lot about the, the neocortex, which is the front lobe of the brain. That's where all the rational decision making is, uh, takes place. Okay. And and the limbic brain, the limbic brain is way here at the back of the head. And uh, I'm just paraphrasing, and he says this a lot better than I do, but <laughs> the limbic brain is, is where a lot of the non-rational, emotional, and sort of gut decisions come from, or gut feelings come from. And that's where actually consumers make 90% plus of their purchase decisions from. So this is, and this is, I'm going to say this again. People don't buy with their rational mind. We think they do. But in fact, they buy with their emotional mind and or with their gut, as you're saying. You know, they're, they're buying from the heart. They're buying from the gut or, or what, what, you know, is called the, the limbic brain, which is the back of the head. And that's where a lot of us are making purchase decisions from. And so it's so important to tap into emotion, to tap into things that are not always rational because that's what really gets, that's where the juices start to flow. That's where people start to connect. And, and that's where just life happens, right? So. Awesome. Well, now that you were talking about emotional stuff, how can the people that are listening to this show actually get a hold of you? They wanted to find out more about branding possibly even hiring your services, how can they find you? Is there a website or a Facebook page or something like that that you want to share with them? Yeah. So my website is sivamarketing.ca, siva, S-I-V-A. 
just like the logo that you see right behind me. And uh, there'll be a link as well. What I'm going to do is, is throw in a link. I think it's going to be so much fun for people to try. Uh, it's an archetype assessment. So if you're curious, if you're just a little bit curious about who you think you may be and you, you just want to get to know and, you know, nothing, there's really no commitment. It's just about doing it. It's like a five minute test. Most people do it in under five minutes and you'll get a really top level assessment of what your dominant archetype may be. And so if you're interested in doing that, there's a link that we're going to share right below that people can, uh, can click and find other personalities. Well, that's fantastic. So for those of you out there that are listening or on the, or on the video that are actually watching this, you're going to be going to Siva, S-I-V-A, marketing, dot C-A, not dot com, because this is dot C-A for Canada. So Canada. <laughs> uh, and she's going to have a link on there that she's going to be giving away a compliment. This is complimentary. Is that correct? That's correct. So this yeah. is a complimentary assessment. I know I took that assessment a couple of weeks ago. Yep. And, and, you know, I sent that, that, sent that information to you. And I know you and I are going to be starting possibly working together as well here in the very yep. near future. So, again, go to sivamarketing.ca and you can take that assessment and they will get the results by email, I would assume, after they finish with it. That's correct. Okay. Yep. And then also, I believe you, you'll have your contact information on there on your website as well in case they yep. wanted to contact you. Yeah, and we've got a we've got a one eight hundred toll free number, so they can call. You know, some people still like to talk, so if they do, uh, we will pick up the phone. So just give us a call. Uh, we've got you know Facebook page, LinkedIn page, so uh, we're pretty uh, we're pretty accessible. But but start by doing the test. It, it'll be really fun, just if nothing else for yourselves. So yeah. Yeah, and there's no obligation, so that's 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 phenomenal. Not at all. Okay, well, uh, anything else that you would like to share with the audience, Sabrina, before we say goodbye to everybody? Well, this is, uh, this is something, yeah, it's, it's been on my mind. And you know what, I just, I want to share this. This is something that a coach once told me, and it really inspired me in a moment that I was, I was searching for myself, and I was, I was trying to find that path. And it's something that I want to share today. Okay. Don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive and then go out and do that because what the world needs is more people who have come alive. And so my message is just come alive, connect with yourself, get to know yourself and stand out in your true self and you'll be on the way to success. Well, wow, that, that's very nice. That's so that's the best thing to provide the world is to come alive and just contribute. And therefore, you're, that's, what, that's what the world needs. That's awesome. be you. Exactly. Be you. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sabrina. It's been a pleasure kind of catching up with you over these last 40 or so minutes that we've been talking with each other. And I'm so glad you came onto our show. I was, I was really anticipating this because after you and I talked about branding, of, we talked about Coca-Cola and Nike as well. And then that's when I started really going through my head. It's like, oh my gosh, what do I need for my own branding of not only Plentiful Perspectives, which is the company that's putting on the Life's Little Lessons show, as well as my own coaching and business coaching business as well. So I know you're not going to be talking yeah. and I'm definitely looking forward to talking to you about that. And maybe in the future, would you be willing to come back on a future show in a, in a few months and just see how things have changed? How can I say no to you, Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you very much. If you want to work with uh, Sabrina, she's absolutely an amazing woman. That's going to be at sivamarketing.ca. It will be down in the description, so with the link for the free assessment. And I want to say thank you uh, for being on the show, and I look forward to talking with you uh, offline. Thank you very much, Sabrina. Thanks, Kevin. Talk soon. Talk soon. You have a good day. You too. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Life's Little Lessons with your host, author of Designing Your Own Destiny, Kevin A. Dunlap. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit PlentifulPerspectives.com, Facebook.com slash Kevin A. Dunlap dot author, and on Twitter at Kevin A. Dunlap. We'll catch you on the next episode of Life's Little Lessons.